Psalms 115, we'll be looking at verses 1 through 8. Psalm 115, starting in verse 1. Not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but unto thy name give glory, and for thy mercy, and for thy truth's sake. Wherefore should the heathen say, Where is now their God? But our God is in the heavens. He hath done whatsoever he pleased. Their idols are silver and gold, the works of men's hands. They have mouths, but they speak not. Eyes have they, but they see not. They have ears, but they hear not. Noses have they, but they smell not. They have hands, but they handle not. Feet have they, but they walk not. Walk not. Neither speak they through their throat. They that make them are like unto them. So is every one that trusteth in them. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this wonderful and beautiful morning. Father, I do pray for your spirit, Lord. I pray for the, the Herald family as they go about their travels. And Father, I just I pray to be able to communicate your word, Lord, and that we just really think about how wonderful and glorious you truly are. How unique that you are in the whole universe. Father, we love you. I love you. In Jesus' name, amen. This passage of scripture is specifically talking about the false gods of other pagan cultures. The psalmist states that they worship idols that cannot see or talk or feel or walk, but instead they're deaf, dumb, and blind. Is all religion false or is there something different about this particular God named Yahweh? You have to understand that in our frame of mind today, it's, it's different. And today's unbelieving culture, they'll say that, well, Christianity is just like any other religion. You know, it's just rehashed religion. But let me try to provoke your thought and to help you understand the difference between the gods of the earth and the one true and living God who does stand out from all, uh, all among the other pagan deities. Now, what's really amazing about this is I took on this study several years ago, and I said, I asked this question. Questions are good. When you go to answer questions, they really strengthen and build your faith. I asked this question. I stepped out by faith, trusted Christ by Savior, but I want to know, you got all these atheists that will say, oh, this is just rehashed religion, whatever else. I want to know, is that true? Okay. Is the God of the Bible unique? If he's not unique, then it is just rehashed. Or is he truly unique and therefore the one true and living God? And so I asked a lot of questions. We're only going to deal with three questions today, but there's a whole lot more you can ask. And when you come to the end of this, uh, or come to the end of answering those questions, those individual little questions, it really does build your faith. So starting with the first question, or the thing that makes, well, what, make God, what makes God different? But the first sub point here is every other religion is polytheistic or pantheistic except for one. Every other religion is polytheistic, means that they worship multiple gods, or pantheistic means they worship everything around them except for one. Verse number two. It says, Wherefore should the heathen say, Where is now their God? But our God is in the heavens. He hath done whatsoever he hath pleased. The question is posed by the heathen in Psalm 115, Where is now their God? The same question is being asked today. When one studies the religions of the world in our current societies, we see them try hard to adapt and modify themselves to, to, to uh, Judeo-Christianity. For instance, Buddhism was not previously charitable. It wasn't a charitable religion. Because if you interfered with somebody else's karma, you would take their issues upon yourself. So when somebody looked at somebody going through troubles of life, it goes, oh, well, that's probably because of something that happened in their past life. And you don't interfere with that because they're suffering for something they previously had done. 
So you didn't have charitable organizations like that until Christianity. Now, the society has many <laughs> Buddhist uh, charitable organizations because Christianity set the standard. So you can't look at the topic with a 21st century lens. You have to go back into history and to see how these different gods were viewed in the cultures that they were in. Only then can you know what the real truth is. There's, much, there's been much ink spilled over this topic of who the original gods were and their origin. But first thing you have to do is eliminate, have a process of elimination. For instance, you don't even entertain Islam. Why? Because in 600 AD, AD, Muhammad took from the Jewish God and the gods of the pagans and to shape and form his own God. I'm very versed in Islam. I went to school to study Arabic. I've reached Muslims. I had a chance to speak to imams and these types of things. And so they took, Muhammad took from Christianity, took from Judaism, took from some of the pagan deities to shape and form his own. The, the God of the Quran, Allah, is not the same God of the Bible. They are two different gods. Essentially, Islam is a cult. It's like the Mormons or Jehovah's Witnesses and that has a leader that looks at Christianity and says, your religion is corrupt and your God has shown me, or uh, God has shown me what, what really is real religion, so follow me. That's what these prophets do. Jo, the leader of uh, Charles Taze Russell, Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, you know, Joseph Smith, uh, Christianity is corrupt, follow me. Islam, same thing with Muhammad. Um, but let's go back further in time than modern religions. Let's go back further. 400 BC, we see Hinduism in India and the polytheistic culture it represents. It's quite normal even today to see an individual's home in India with, a sh with shelves full of gods. Hindu Hinduism is a very old and form of religion, but just another name for gathering various deities. We see Buddhism, which came a little bit after that. Buddha simply means the enlightened one. A man named Siddhartha Gautama, who grew up in 500 BC in a Hindu family, saw the suffering and pain in the world, and he was distressed by all the idol worshiping. He set out on a personal campaign to find release from this world of suffering and pain himself. After about six years in fasting, he was reduced to skin and bones, and he thought that he achieved enlightenment through his meditation. His so-called truths that he preached had nothing to do with God, but were atheistic in nature. Though man is doing, through man doing good works uh, to end human suffering. Now what's ironic about all of that is he saw the people around him bowing down to all these idols, and he tried to make a separate philosophy. And what ends up happening is he became an idol, and they made more very similar, different Buddhas and these types of things. That's very ironic. And those are just a few of the major world religions, but let's go back even further. 4,000 years, what kind of religions do we find? Even before the mention of the Egyptian gods, which was 3150 BC. Before that, there were three to four main gods that took on different names and different cultures around the cradle of civilization in the Middle East. So we're looking at about 5,500 BC or so. Now this is very important to see what the origin of the world religions are and the discovery of truth. The first one you have is the god Baal, or Baal, as you say in the Bible. He, he was seen as the prince of the earth and the lord of the dew and rain. He was the general fertility god of the people who, who was worshipped for a few thousand years. Then you had the god Dagon. You see him as the Philistines' uh, god, who was apparently God's father and the origin, or the uh, god of the grains, little g god of the grains. He supposedly invented the plow of the field. Dagon kind of phased out and all of his attributes were transferred to Baal at about 1500 BC or so. Now I bring all of this information up because you'll start to see that, that these pagan deities do shift in shape, but only one remains the same. So we'll start to see that. Then you have Asherah, the goddess of war and love. She was known in various cultures by names of Ishtar, Astarte, Aphrodite. She was the mother of over 70 gods. Go figure. And later, she was attributed to being the wife of Baal. So she was the wife of Dagon, and eventually it shifted to being the wife of Baal, and so things, over, things shift in shape over time. Then you have the other one, Molech. You see him written in the scriptures as well, about people who burn their children to Molech, the infamous Molech, or the bullheaded man. The children of men 
were sacrificed to this god as the, on the altar of an, of an image of a bullheaded man that was heated up, searing red, and the child was placed in the open arms of Molech. Molech was the origin or orig- of the uh, idea of the Minotaur later and the great maze that he protected. You know, we actually have some recordings of what took place during those ceremonies. You have an uh, ancient Greek named Plutarch. He wrote about one of these ceremonies and what he saw. He said this, The whole area before the statue was filled with a loud noise of flutes and drums so that the cries of the wailing of the children being sacrificed could not reach the ears of the people. Very sad. The previously mentioned gods, little g gods, were worshipped at the same time and all amongst each other. Here is what's fascinating. Standing out from among all the other gods of this time was Yahweh. Yahweh stated he is above all gods and there is none like unto him. This is not meaning that he is the king of the gods, but that he is the only god and he takes great offense to those people who worship other little g gods. Now this is a completely different thought. You have to understand that this is a completely different thought from that entire time period. Because it had been accepted that you just worship whatever god, multiple gods as you wanted. It was not uncommon for people to worship various gods from other countries. We don't really understand that today because we have three major monotheistic religions that shape our perception today. We don't really understand that because of the modern or the monotheistic religions that, you know, they, it, it just, we think, oh, that's, it's always been this way. Well, it's not been this way for you to worship only one God a long time ago. That was a huge deal. That was a very huge deal. And you were persecuted for it. Uh, in the time of the Romans, the Romans had no problem with Christians as long as they were okay with worshiping everybody. But the fact that the Christians said, no, we're only worshiping one God. That was a problem. That was a major problem. And that he is the only God. That was a problem to the Romans, hence the persecution. Now, in the book of Exodus, chapter 20, verse 3, it says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. So what God said. He laid the standards down. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Exodus, chapter 23, in verse, th- uh, verse 13, it says, And in all things I have said unto you, Be circumspect. And make no mention of the name of other gods, neither let it be heard out of thy mouth. When they were coming to the promised land, when Joshua and the, and the children of Israel were going through conquering different cities and uh, taking the promised land, Joshua said, Now therefore fear the Lord, and serve him in sincerity and in truth, and put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt, and serve ye the Lord. Now, many times when you see the Lord written in capital letters, that is the name of God written there. They just put Lord. And so you have Yahweh deal and judge his people. And really, he, there was a reason why he didn't want to take from any nation that was already around. He said that I'm going to take and make my own nation. He took a man and his wife and said, I'm going to make a nation out of them because he wanted to make sure that they were all separate. So he didn't choose like ancient peoples, like I'm going to choose the Canaanites or I'm going to choose the Hittites or whatever and then change their pagan gods and all sorts of stuff. He said, no, I'm going to start originally, take a person and make a nation out of them. That's very unique. Now with the fulfillment of the, the scripture with the coming of the Messiah, Jesus Christ, Judeo-Christianity still stands alone as the only monotheistic religion from the beginning of mankind. I want you to think about that. That is very, very unique. It is statistically improbable. Statistically improbable that, and mathematically impossible about. They, there's a, in math, when they have their exponents go to a certain um, set of zeros, if it gets the number gets to be too big, they just label it as impossible, even though that theoretically there is still a chance in however many zeros there are, but there comes a certain point and a certain amount of zeros of the exponents where they label it impossible to ever happen. So how could you have the same God move all throughout history 
and different, like thousands of years of history, and still stay consistent throughout the entire time without any changing or shifting, just like the other little G, like shifting, like the other little G gods are doing all around them. Because remember, like Asherah shifted from different cultures, took different names, Astarte, Ishtar, uh, the Greeks took, uh, took her as well, the Aphrodite. So you've had all these little G gods that will shift and shape names, but yet one god, capital letter, capital letter G god, stays consistent from the beginning of time, recorded history all the way through that we know of. That is impossible, unless he really is real. So first we've seen that all other religions are polytheistic or pantheistic, except for one. Now, every other religion has an image, except for one. Let's look at verse 4 through 7. It says in Psalm 115, Their idols are of silver and gold, the works of men's hands. They have mouths, but they speak not. Eyes have they, but they see not. They have ears, but they hear not. Noses have they, but they smell not. They have hands, but they handle not. Feet have they, but they walk not. Neither speak they through their throat. God speaks in Psalm 115 about the deaf, dumb, and blind idols that the heathen worship. Every religion in the world has an image of some character to worship. The ancient gods had magnificent wonders built unto them. The Greeks and the Romans were the epitome of statues that, you know, they built these massive statues and temples to their gods. The three ancient wonders of the world were made by the Greeks. You had the Colossus at Rhodes, supposed to have been a huge statue of the little G god Colossus at the entrance, I believe, of it was um, at Alexandria. It might be at a different place. Or no, Rhodes. Sorry, it was at Rhodes. It was a massive statue supposed to be at the, uh, the beginning of the port or whatever. Eventually came down due to an earthquake, which is funny, actually. You find out that that's a, that's a common thing. <laughs> it's like God goes, oh, that's, that's nice. That's, that's great. <laughs> it comes crumbling down. It's hilarious, actually, how many, uh, you know, ancient wonders of man had tried to build come down because of earthquakes. It's, it's funny, actually. I think God has a sense of humor. I really do. <laughs> oh, man. And, uh, the temple at Artemis. Uh, Temple of Artemis at Ephesus. This is actually mentioned in the New Testament uh, by its Roman's name, Roman's name, uh, the Temple of Diana. So the Roman name was Diana, but it was called Artemis uh, in Greek. And then you have the statue of Zeus at Olympia. These are three of the ancient wonders of the world. Those were made by the Greeks. They took uh, great care to make their massive statues. And we find statues and great ziggurats back in ancient cultures for the gods Baal or Asherah or Molech, all throughout the ancient cultures. Despite the wonders man has built across all the world, the timeless and only God of the Bible states that his people are not to make an image of him. I want you to think about that. That is astounding. That is absolutely astounding. He says, I am the invisible God. You will not make an image of me. In fact, if Israel tried to make an image and say, well, we're worshiping you, God, he judged them. Why? Because he was going to be unique from anything that man tried to devise. He is literally the only God in all of humanity's history that has no image. That is unbelievable. You go back through history. History is kind of my thing if you can't tell already. You know, but you go back through history. I study these things. I, I find it so fascinating. I, I took on this study. Literally, there was no other deity that has an image, that does not have an image. None whatsoever. It's almost like God said, no, no, no. I'm not going to be like these other little pagan G gods, little G gods. I'm going to be separate. I'm going to be unique. You realize how impossible that is? Let's just take the first one, that all of the religions are polytheistic. What are the odds or the chances? That's a pretty big number that God stays the same. Like I said, monotheistic religion was only recently a thing. Going back in history, that wasn't the case. What are the odds? It's a pretty big number. You think, okay, is it possible it could be wrong? Maybe. Now we're stacking on another one. 
The only God in the history of man that doesn't have an image. In fact, God gets mad at you and judges you if you try to make an image of him. You realize how insane that sounds to the common person. Go to any, you can study any religion. They have an idol to worship. Any other religion. Exodus chapter 20 and verse 4. It says, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in the heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Why would God say this? Because he knows that man has been prone to idolatry from the very beginning. That's exactly the reason why. If you make an idol, people will bow down and worship the idol. No man, no matter what culture you look upon, no matter what hemisphere of the world that you're in, you will find an image or statues dedicated to their pagan gods. When I saw the Dead Sea Scrolls, I saw some of the oldest manuscripts of the New Testament. They came by to Pasadena, and it was really an awesome exhibit. Um, th thousands of years old. You're looking at these manuscripts of the Old Testament and stuff like that. It's, it's absolutely amazing. Um, and one of the things that astounded me, before you came into the Dead Sea Scroll exhibit itself, they showed you like other things they had dug up in Israel and these types of things. And I'll never forget this. And I think this is very important. I'll never forget this. And I don't think the people who did this even really even understood what they were putting up. But I came around the corner and they had on one side, they had arrowheads from the um, uh, Assyrian army that attacked Samaria and took away the, the, the other tribes of Israel. Uh, they had arrowheads from the Assyrians. And at the bottom, they had Babylonian arrowheads that attacked Judah. Remember the judgment that came after that? Both, city, both uh, nations were judged. It was part of God's judgment. I had to think there, and I looked at those arrowheads. I, I like to put myself into like, you know, t those periods of time. And I think to myself, you know, it's very possible that those arrowheads killed somebody. Very possible it could have hit a house or whatever. But it's also very possible you're looking at arrowheads that actually killed somebody. You're looking at the judgment of God. Unbelievable. And you think, well, what are they judged for? Literally, I'm not even joking. Right next to it. Statues. They found hundreds and hundreds and thousands and thousands, but they couldn't put them all up there, obviously. They put, put, put lines and lines of statues, idols, of the gods, Baal, but mainly Asherah, the sexual deity, for obvious reasons. They were judged for their idolatry. I mean, like I said, I don't, I don't really think that they, the people who set that exhibit up, probably most of those people aren't even saved. Maybe some are, I don't know. But I don't even think they really understood what they're painting the picture there. But it was truly amazing to me. And I thought, wow, God takes us very, very seriously, bowing down to pagan deities. He takes it very, very seriously, making idols. You know, even, even of the current world religions, Buddhism, it was founded as an anti-idol religion, ends up becoming uh, a bunch of idols. You have different Buddhas now. And man still worships uh, big you know, golden Buddha statues today all across the world. See, God knows that we are prone to idolatry and therefore wants to stand out from among the rest of the gods ever created in history. This is a tremendous thing, considering that man has had an image for the gods of this world, except for one. In the Old Testament, God punished those who would make any idols, whether it was unto him or to pagan deities. Remember, in the, the golden calf debacle, when they crossed the Red Sea, remember when Moses uh, went up uh, to get the word from the Lord, and he was gone for 40 days. And remember, he came back down, and Aaron, and they were dancing around naked before their enemies and playing all sorts of crazy music, and, and they had made a golden calf. They didn't make another god. They had the intention, then the, they took an image that they knew of from Egypt, but they weren't worshiping Baal. They weren't worshiping, you know, Asherah. 
They called that Yahweh. Now you wonder why, now you know why God took such great offense. Number one, don't make an image. But number two, don't, don't make an image of something you took from Egypt. And he judged them. Three, uh, you know, thousands of people died that day from that judgment. Even within Christianity, there have been branches that have broken off and gone down the idolatry path, like uh, Catholics worshiping Mary and angels and saints and all sorts of idols and statues everywhere. God specifically says, do not do this. Do not do this. And yet, what is man's natural thing to do? Bow down to an idol. You see it all across the world. We're just a little more sophisticated in the Western world in how we do idolatry, you know? Yahweh, God's name, is so specific that when Moses asked God by what name he shall go unto the people of Israel, and God said, I am. God is essentially states that I am the maker of the universe. I am not made by men's hands. You know, God's divine name is a whole separate message I've, I've developed. It's an amazing study of what makes him who he is. It's very, very powerful. God does everything specifically with a rhyme and a reason and a purpose. If there's one thing that will greatly help you in your Bible study and your Bible interpretation and understanding of the Word of God, that everything God says to do, not to do, or that He does, always has a rhyme and reason to it. These people at that moment who are maybe experiencing certain things may not understand at that moment, but in the grand scheme, you start to see the larger picture come to play. God never, ever does anything on a whim. That's what pagan deities do. Change of emotion, the Greek gods and goddesses, the Greek pantheon, doing whatever they want. They get mad at people, all sorts of other stuff, on, the, on a whim, right? But everything God says to do or not to do, or that he does, has a perfect rhyme and reason to it. And you can see that flow throughout the biblical history. Everything from the sacrifices of the lamb. What was that supposed to picture? The Messiah coming. He always he works through he works with man through pictures. Keeping an eye, keeping an imageless, uh, an Im, uh, being imageless, I mean, that's for a rhyme and a reason. Because he knows that man is prone to idolatry. So everything that he does or says to do or not to do has a perfect rhyme and reason to it. That will greatly help you in your um, Bible interpretation. So first we saw that all the other gods were polytheistic or pantheistic except for one. Second, all religions have an image except for one. Now for our third, every other religion requires a works-based salvation except for one. Verse number eight, they that make, in Psalm 115, they that make them are like unto them. So is everyone that trusteth in them. Every religion in history has devised some sort of works-based salvation minus one. Thousands of years of religions coming and going, yet one remains the same. Now, remember what I said about that mathematical improbability or our probability of, uh, you know, being impossible with that first point. Now you have the second point stacked upon it. It makes it literally impossible to happen by chance. Now you have this third one. The odds are stacked so great for it to happen by chance. Unless God really is who he says that he is. He really is real. The Greeks, the Romans... They had a very definitive view of works with the difference being Elysium or Tartarus. Hinduism and its sub-religion, Buddhism, are both just endless cycles of reincarnation, hoping that some sort of nirvana will take place at the end of that road after enough good work. So-called Christian groups, there's only one branch that keeps the road from works. Catholicism works plus God's grace, they say grace, it's a contradictory term actually. Paul actually talks about that word for word. But, you know, they add works. 
uh, Mormons, works, and a whole lot of other goofy stuff. Islam, works. You got other things that you know influence uh, other religions influenced by Christianity, works based, but only one in the history of the world is by grace, by faith. Salvation through grace by uh, by faith through grace, God's grace. And you know, there's only actually ultimately two religions in the world. Only two. The first is a religion of works and where you keep trying to earn some God's favor and hoping that you'll be good enough to get to heaven or Elysium or whatever you want to call, you know, that heavenly realm. The other is a religion of grace where God has already paid the price for your entrance into heaven. Think on this. Even if it was works-based, even if, how would you never know when enough is enough? How would you ever know? Now, God would never do this, but just imagine this for a moment. You get to heaven, and you've done a lot of good stuff in your life, and they got these golden scales. The golden scales thing is actually an Islamic concept. But let's say they got the golden scales thing you know, weighing your works, and God goes, you are one good work shy of going to heaven. Sorry. I hit a little button, you drop down or something, right? <laughs> you know? <laughs> now, God would never do that, all right? But... How would you ever know when enough is enough? You would never know. It's almost like God set everything in order for us and already knew how man would devise their pagan religions. And yet, one, his true religion through grace, by faith, sets out from amongst all the others, unique throughout all of history. There are even some that are within so-called Christianity that turn away and they state that well it's works that bring you to salvation and they've brought the sacrifice that jesus christ paid with his blood for nothing look if you honestly look if you could work your way to get to heaven then there was no point to christ he died for nothing because literally you could let's just say you go to heaven you'd be like i appreciate you sending your son lord but um have you seen my resume i've done a pretty good job right <laughs> You see what I'm saying? You don't need Christ then. If it's works-based, you do not need Christ. That's what makes these two ideas so distinctly different. You cannot have both. You cannot have both. They are contradictory to each other. Only through Christ and his sacrifice and his work set from the foundation of the world can we even have God's grace and uh, attain eternal life. That's the only way. That price that was paid by Christ, by placing himself on the cross of Calvary, through Jesus Christ the Messiah and paying that sin debt, sin debts that we could never pay for. I don't know you guys and what sins you've committed, but I know myself. I'm so very thankful for God's great gift of mercy. I know what I deserve, and it ain't heaven. You know, in fact, uh, I was in the Marine Corps for a long time. I, some of you guys know this. I was in the Marine Corps for a long time. And I remember the soul winner that came by with a gospel track. And they asked me, if you were to die today, where would you go? I said, oh, I'm going to hell, straight up. I know what I've done. And they showed me from the Bible how I can know for sure that I go to heaven when I die. And I trusted Christ in my barracks room that day. I was just honest. Like, man, I already knew. I already knew what, all the things that I've done. There's no way that a God of love or anything would accept me. In my own mind, anyways. And they showed me through the Bible how I could be saved. And truly, Christ's sacrifice is that great. It's not just that Jesus Christ, humanly speaking, lived a sinless life and sacrificed himself on that cross, because any man can die, but only God can raise from the dead. That's very important. When we share the gospel as Christians, you just don't say, well, Jesus died for you. Any man can die. What makes Jesus Christ different is that he rose from the grave. What did he tell the Pharisees? He goes, you want a sign? Watch, I'm going to raise out of the grave after three days. That's going to be your sign, and that's going to seal the deal for redemption is the resurrection. We have eternal life because of Jesus Christ resurrecting from the dead. But you know what? There are lots of dead prophets buried all around the world. A lot of different religions. 
<coughs> Islam and the Prophet Muhammad buried in Medina in Saudi Arabia. The founder of Buddhism, you can go and see his right tooth buried in Sri Lanka. They kind of divided up his body. It was kind of weird, okay? They put him in all sorts of different places. You had Confucius buried in Shandong, China. Sikhism's founder is buried in India. But you, there's no body you're going to find for Jesus Christ. Why? There's no tomb. I mean, they think they have a couple tombs. They think where Jesus may have laid. But either way, you're not going to find a body. Because he came out of the grave. Amen? <laughs> Any man can die, but only God can raise from the dead. Jesus then showed himself to over 500 people and taught his apostles. Acts chapter 1 and verse 3. It says, To whom he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs being seen of them forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and verse 50, a little bit of a extent, let's, let's all turn there, how about that? We have a lot, of, uh, a lot of verses here for this one, seven verses, but it's pretty extensive. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, starting in verse 50. 1 Corinthians 15, starting in verse 50, it says, Now I say, now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood, cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither the corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of the eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. There is only one religion in the world where God wants a personal relationship with you because he loves you. That's actually a whole separate thing that you can study out. The only God in all of history that actually loves you. Study it out. You've got lots of deities that are, you know, tis for tad, you know, you know, a quid pro quo, you know, we heard learn about those words, you know, but in the last several years, you know, uh, but there's only one God in the history of man that actually loves you. That's a whole separate study in itself. God wants a personal relationship with you because he loves you. The God of the entire universe has made himself so distinct and so different from all the other world's religions that he says in Romans 1.20, Chapter 1 and verse 20, it says, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even in his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. We are without excuse before God. The heathen will rage and say, Where is now their God? Ignorance. Ignorance, but they are without excuse. So the final question this morning is, as a Christian, how do you view God? Do you view him as God? We took that step by faith to trust him for our salvation. But do you really believe he is God? He has shown himself throughout history. He has shown himself unique. He has shown his power and greatness. He has shown his care for you in your life, in my life. Do you believe him as God? If there's anybody here that is asking that near 2,000-year-old question, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Ask questions. Know that Christ has paid that price for your sins. Recognize that you're that sinner, that they deserve that punishment. And you have to accept Christ as your Savior, to, for that payment of your sins. We can't put aside that call of salvation. I assume most people here are probably saved. But if as Christians, there's some things that we have to think about. Remember that word works? God does judge by works, for one thing, what you do for him as a Christian. Now, people get this a little weirded up, 
But Paul says this specifically that your works as a Christian will be tried through a fire. It will translate to however God's going to orchestrate that in heaven. So it's not paid for your, it's not a payment for your uh, eternal security, but for what you're going to do in heaven, I guess. We're going to have jobs or something. I don't know how it's going to work out. God calls it rewards in heaven. We don't know how that all works out. And I don't believe God tells us for a reason how that actually translates because people get a little weird in their teachings and stuff. Can you imagine? <laughs> church of the crown of righteousness. Uh, the, ch the church of, you know, whatever. You know, people get weird about that stuff. But, but God says that, yeah, your, your works as a Christian will be tried through the fire. So get busy. Will they be wood, hay, and stubble or... Uh, gold, silver, precious stones. But you're already saved. It's not for your eternal security or your, uh, you know, a chance to be able to go to heaven. But what are you doing for him now? That's important. Romans chapter 14. Let's all look at that real quick. Romans chapter 14. Now this is for people who are lost, but also for people who are saved. I want you to think about this. Romans chapter 14 and verse 11. It says, For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, Every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. Think about that. Every single one of us will give an account to God. I don't know about you, but I know about me. I need to be more devoted. I need to do more things for Christ. I need to make a bigger difference upon this world for Christ. We all do. Every single one of us will give an account of ourselves to God one day. You know, we have that difference as a Christian. The Apostle Thomas, he was a saved man, but he had some doubts, didn't he? About the resurrection. Until he saw Christ and Jesus said, Thomas, put your hand on my side. You don't believe me? You didn't believe I rose up from the dead? You know what he said? In Greek, in the Greek New Testament, he says, Ha kurios mu ka ha theos mu. What is that? My Lord and my God. He believed because he saw. Let us not be that way. Let's get busy because we will give an account one day as Christians. Let's get busy. The world is getting darker, but that's okay. We got a very, very, bright light. We worship a God that is consistent from the very beginning, and He loves us. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this wonderful and beautiful day. Thank you for the great opportunity and privilege it is to be able to be here in your house. Father, I pray that if there's anybody here that's not saved, or even if they have questions, they would ask those questions, that today could be their day of salvation, how they could have their sins wiped away and blotted out by the blood of Jesus Christ. And Father, I pray for the Christians that are here, Lord, that they realize that there is a method to everything going on, that you're working with them and shaping them and molding them, that one day we're faithful, we'll be rewarded. And one day we'll get to be with Christ. One day this sinful world will pass away. One day we'll be with you, Lord. Father, we love you. I just pray for your hand upon us the rest of the day. We love you. I love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.